Let's look at your, your Dublin career. You, you played for the guts of a decade with the, the boys in blue. Can you tell me when you, about when you got first called up and your memory of that? Yeah, um, actually, my first call up was for the Auburn Cup in '96, um, and I'd only finished playing minor. I was minor captain, minor captain, and uh, it was fun. it's a funny story actually because uh, I was actually on my out, out of the shops and uh, beside the mill house in Stillorgan, and uh, I bumped into Robbie Brennan, who 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 we obviously uh, were met with Crocs at the moment, but he said to me, he said, "Johnny, uh, this is." Congratulations! You have to get a uh, call up to the Dubs. And I said, "What are you talking about?" So I hadn't heard a thing. I said, "Oh, it's in the paper." I said, "You're joking me." He said, "No, no." So I, by the time I got back to the house, then a phone call had come from I think the secretary of our club. I think it was uh, Larry Ryan, and he had rang my mom and, "Oh yeah, you're 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 you're, you're picked to play the Auburn Cup down in Wexford," um, which was obviously another another kind of sentimental thing because my man's from Wexford and I spent all my Christmases, Easter's and summers in Wexford so um, and yeah I made my debut down in Wexford against my, my I suppose uh, my mum's home county you know and the fact that this Dublin team wasn't long after winning in All-Ireland too so to get called up like that must have been exciting yeah absolutely look um, I was on the hill in 95 and um, would have followed that team uh, you know up and down the country um, when I was allowed to you know and in fairness the club would organise different coaches and stuff the different management coaches we had at the time would bring us along so yeah uh, watching Desi and Paul Corn and the likes and then having an opportunity to to play alongside them when I'd only li literally watched them for the previous how many years and they would have been legends in my eyes you know I suppose you know, to get that opportunity to to you know to go and play alongside him and talk out alongside him, so it was, um, which was was huge for me. Um, would have been always going to the double matches uh, with my friends and like I remember '94 against Down and it was in, on the hill with my father and we got drowned. Um, you know, it was all those memories of like great memories. I I would find looking back on it, you know, and then it's, it's great seeing like you know before Lauren play for Dublin. She would go to the double matches as well with my wife and myself and that. So look, it's, there's a nice bit of history there behind it, you know. Did it take you long to settle into the panel? Um, I, like, it, it wasn't until I made my league debut in 97 against Ligo. Um, I remember talking with Mickey and Mickey just felt, look, Johnny, as I just feel you're probably, you're probably a little bit too young. Um, and at that time, you know, it was, you know, if it wasn't the policy if you're, if you're, Good enough, you're old enough. It was more like you had to save your time. Um, so I went back with the club, and you know, I was well, obviously was, uh, when I got into the senior team, when Robbie Keller became the manager then and started playing a lot of league football. And, and uh, I suppose Robbie Keller was the one who kind of earmarked me for centre back, where I'd never played centre back like underage or minor, I was always midfield all the way through. And I suppose I played, uh, I was a Full forward for the minor team, uh, but came out as a kind of tour midfielder type of thing. So I never played centre back, and you know John Sweeney had been a centre back for Crokes previous, and he had stepped away. So they were looking to fill in fill, fill the spot. So Robbie approached, said, "Me, look, I want you to do a job." And I think we, we like you know, we love you to play centre back, and you know you trial by error. And like you know, in fairness, the lads around me, you know the likes of Peter Ward and, and uh, Con Cleary and, and Robbie Leahy, you know, guided me in terms of you know because I never really being a defender so um it was all about you know stick close to your man always make sure you mark your man tightly for the first 10 15 minutes and then when you got the grips of how you got to know the player you're marking then then impose my game on them and drive me forward and look utilizing that from that point of view you know so the dublin team had gone from being champions tonight uh, in 1995 and then Meath and Kildare obviously are very very strong and we all know how long it took before Dublin won in All-Ireland again. But those couple of years, was it because you kind of went back from the team that was in 95 or was it because Mead and Kildare kicked on? And often you were um, no bad team either. Yeah, and no, often you were a good side. Like, you know, for me, I think it was, the you know, Mickey Whelan took over uh, at that time and uh, Mickey was ahead of his game um, in relation to his thought process in, in, in with, with football. You know, it was all about working with the football and getting tired with the football and everyone was doing the football and it was a different total philosophy than what the lads have been used to where it was real more kind of try and test it where you, you ran and you ran and you ran and, you know, you, you did your football and, you know, there was a lot, there was a different comparisons and I suppose you, you were, I would have got that feel within the group when I, when I first went into the start training with, 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 the, with the team in 97 and you could see there was a bit of a, you know, the players didn't trust Mickey. 
you know, um, and that was a big factor. Um, and like you know, you had, you had lads who were legends who who achieved everything in the game, and you know, I suppose they found it probably difficult to kind of to try and transform over to his philosophy, where they, the the philosophy that they had been obviously played under over the, like the early nineties, and which brought them success. You know, got the All Ireland finals, won an All Ireland national league titles, Leinster titles, and and I suppose they tried and tested, and the what they would have been used to probably was a bit difficult to change. With the way Mickey came in with the different philosophy, you know, and I think that was a big thing that it was that was to the detriment I felt of that that era of you know the hangover of '95. I suppose the lads got over the line '95 was like you know it was more relief than celebration because they been knocking on the door so much and you know where those lads that like who have been soldiers for so many years with Dublin, you know. Um, trying to change a different way of, of playing and I suppose that was the big thing and then like Mickey stepped away well obviously after the Offaly match and like that was horrendous like that was my, was my, my second game in my league game in and uh, you know the way he, why he, he endured that day which should never have happened um, but, and I think that was it then Tommy Carr came in mid-season and I suppose the there was a lot of transition. There was a, um, there's a lot of young lads came through. Uh, or well, Tommy brought them through. But look at fairness, Mickey brought a few lads through. Like there was likes of myself, Wilo, um, Ian Robertson, Cosy, you know, Mick O'Keefe. There's a lot of young fellas who were Potter Andrews. We were up, we were being brought in around that time. Paddy Christie, and he, you know, I think Mickey had. I remember speaking to Mickey. I think it was Eamon Heary's wedding. Uh, after he had been, uh, he stepped away. It was uh, he was he wanted to build a team around the young. The so-called younger lads who come through and kind of build a spine around the around the team, I suppose. And look, it, he didn't get enough time, and I suppose he probably felt it was with the results. I think I was way felt it was time to step away, and then he had Tommy Carr to step in, and probably Tommy was at the had played with a lot of those guys as well. Do you know what I mean? So that would have been difficult in itself, you know. Um, which would have been, you know, would lads respect Tommy as a manager, or would he would have respect him as 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 a, as a, as a player? So, like, I felt there that was there was a lack of respect towards Tommy at the time as well, you know. Yeah, and like for yourself, those first couple of championship games, do you remember making your championship debut, and like, were you overawed by it? Yeah, I suppose there, there's there's always a story behind different scenarios. Like, you know, I suppose I'd won it. Was I won a, a county title with, with Croaks in '98 as centre back, and that was the year we got to the Leinster final, the saga with Air Og, and you know I would have been quietly confident in myself, my own ability that I was I was good enough to play centre back for Dublin. And I, look, I played for Dublin from the age of ten all the way through underage, and would have always been uh, made sure I was a starter and, and being a part of starting fifteen as such. And you know I spent. This, majority of 98 on the bench you know um, which was frustrating uh, in the sense so like Keith Barr had was finishing up I had finished and there was there was a void in centre back like Paul I think we played Leash in the Leinster Championship and we drew and we were lucky to draw with Leash and there was like Paul Corns I don't know who was centre back but there was Leisure centre back and I look I just went to Tommy Carr after the first John match with Leash and said Tommy I could do a job for you. I said, I'll send it back. I said, you trust me to do a job or you don't? I said, I waste my time here, you know, because I'd always said to myself, if I had made a dumb team by the time I was 21, I was always going to waste my I would not waste my time. So, in fairness to him, I went and he said, right, you're in. And that was it. I went and, like, Mark Mick Lawler, I think it was, and uh, he got man in the match the first day and I went in and I, I kind of nullified him the in the replay and, and didn't look back since then, you know. And then, obviously, the 99 lens the final with the Charo Royal sleeves and the whole lot. So it was, you know, to go from one to, to go from fly like, you be our first championship match and not really playing much league football leading into that to, you know, getting your championship start uh, and then thrown into the deep end, which I, I didn't mind, I relished it. And then then playing against probably, you know, one of the best centre forwards of that era, you know what I mean, in the, in the Leinster final. So, uh, yeah, look, it was... It was daunting, but I, I relished it. You know, it was it was the one thing I had dreamt of. You know, the, dreaming of winning all Ireland with Dublin and and playing for Dublin and for Pimlico Court as well. I suppose they they were the driving factors behind me. And then uh, also there was another factor where I wanted to be that one or the, the a regular of, of on a Dublin team and be the first Crocs player to be a regular on a Dublin team where you know the where where there wasn't 
met many before. Like, there was lads who had who been there, like, like Clancy, Paddy O'Donnell, who had been on the panels, and Mick Pander and uh, Darren Marr in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, where, but they were never kind of, you know, they were f- the fantastic footballers, but never f- broke through. And is that there's the, that north side, south side thing as well that, that came along that, with that as well. You know, there was a lot of that going on when I was playing as well. So, so at, at what point did, did um, like your, your daughter Lauren has won All Ireland now with the Dublin Ladies uh, team, but at what point did did, uh, did she come along? And you, I presume you were oh. still quite young. I was very young. Yeah, it was um, Lauren was born in ninety seven. So yeah, I was eight, 18, 18. So I was. Um, Funny story, I, look at, I was doing my leave insert that, she was born in the April, I was doing my leave insert that June, and, uh, you know, leaving Dundrum College to go up the road, up to Sandyford, where, where she was, her nanny was mining her and picking her up, and, uh, like, the school bag would be on my back, and the baby harness be on the front, and the, and the, and the, and, and, and the baby bag over the side, and walking from Sandyford down to Stalorgan, down to my ma's, and then my ma helped me out, and... Me trying to study and learn being a baby, you know, it was, yeah, was very young, but um, but look, it would never change it, you know. Um, but like, it was, I suppose, being a young dad at, at a time where, you know, trying to get the balance right between being a young father, getting my studies right, and wanting to play for Dublin, um, and Crokes then, who obviously you were, were top, you know, one of the top teams in, in club football, so you, you know, there was a lot of balls in the year, so you're just trying to get the right balance. and I suppose being a young man, like there was a lot, a lot going on in my life, you know, where you had to try and, ever, there, there was never a dull moment, put it that way, you know, it was always like, you know, training tonight, and then the, the, the following night I'd have Lauren or whatever the case may be. So look, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was great, you know, I, I like, you know, I wouldn't change it for the world, you know, but um, yeah, but it was, it was definitely an experience where you're, you know, choking in all those balls in the air, you know. Yeah, because then they're thinking, a guy that age, is it a case that you're so f- full of energy as a young lad that you're able to go to, from one thing to the next, or does it ever become overwhelming? Um, I suppose uh, I would have had a lot of support, um, you know, with my mom and dad, um, and then my my wife now, Lindsay, um, you know, and then Darren, in fairness to him as well, would have chipped in, so, you know, which you know it was great credit. Like my me and my me and Lauren's mom would have split up in arms for around a year and a half too, and I met my wife. My wife, who my wife is now, so we're together. It was twenty years or twenty odd years, and Lauren knows nobody else but me being with my wife Lindsay. And um, so there would have been a lot of support that way, you know. Um, whereas I would have shared custody with Lauren with her ma- with Lauren's mom, and you know, so I would train. So it would have been I'd have Lauren Monday night drop her to mams the next day I'd tr- and then obviously go to work or school and then I'd try and choose a night then I'd have a Wednesday night drop her back Thursday and then I'd have, I'd have her Friday night all day Saturday and then the following weekend would be Saturday night all day Sunday so that's the way it was balanced up so between the nights that I, I did like so the Monday and Wednesdays were my time with her and uh, you know I give great credit to, to my mom and dad and my wife um, who had a lot of patience you know because you know when my time was with my wife and or my girlfriend at the time Lindsay or and Lauren, she was sharing that with me and and, and the baby, uh, and uh, and then my nights. Then I was trying to choose a Thursday, and then obviously Saturday with Dublin, and you know trying to fit it all in. Yeah, look, it was very, very, very grateful for the support my wife and my my mum and dad gave us, and then Darren, in fairness uh, to him as well. My sister had Denise, but you know Darren had a car as well, and like between the four of us, you know it was it was great, and, and obviously Lauren's mum as well would have helped out. Like she didn't sometimes I'd say, look, can we change the the Saturday or the Sunday of a match, you know. So, you know, but in fairness, look, it was, it was, it, it was, an, it, it was, it was nice that we were able to get on. You know what I mean? And that I would, we, we, that was the one thing. I suppose, like myself and my wife were always conscious with, 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 with Lauren's mom that we had that lovely relationship where we, the fact that we were weren't together it didn't impinge on, on Lauren's life. So, and that was the one thing we were very conscious that, you know, there's people like that. What we were going through, we never in, 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 inhibited her, that we supported her, and that we always got on for for her. And that was, you know, I suppose. You look, you see, you see the young lady in front of you now. And I suppose she's twenty three and three three in a row, and she's all, former all star, and she's fairly well driven, and she's got her degree, and she's looking to be a school teacher. So look, it's you know, very grateful of the support I got at the time, you know.
Absolutely. Your your team then, you know, Tommy Carr probably united the team six points up against Kildare. It didn't kind of happen in 2000. The trip to Tip in 2001, which has been on TV lately, the Armagh 2002, you're in a winning position as well. Why did it not quite happen? Because the talent was there. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I suppose, look, I suppose the, there was there was a lot of, I think, not set up belief, maybe, I think, that Peter Ward, or like, we were weird. The, the 2001 against Kerry, like, you know, I sported the first 10, 15 minutes of the drawn game, we, like, we had so much possession, we just couldn't put it over the bar. I think, you know, we were unlucky, you know, and, and then, I hear the team being unlucky and not and not being lucky, you know, um, there was some decent footballers at the time uh, of that era, and, you know, I suppose against... Against our man in 2002, uh, we were the better. I would have felt we were the better side. Our man players probably disagree with me, but that's my my opinion. I felt we were the better team, and you know, and it was a, we needed a bit of luck on the day, and we didn't get it. Um, and I suppose it was just the aftermath of that. Then you know, um, like if you look at the spine of our man's team, um, you know, you had Bellew, you had Geezer, you had McGrain, you had McEntee, you had Clark, you know, and I would have felt that, that like you know, Joe Kearney would have. May kept that mainstay of that spine, you know. Whereas with ourselves, there was Christy, myself, Willow, I think uh, it was a Desi at the time, uh, but it was either Desi or Jason, or and then the Cosy inside, which was a f- just as equally good, a strong a spine. Um, and I just felt over the next couple of years after 2002, three, that we never kind of kept that kind of main spine together, and you know, and that's what I felt, you know, where you would have looked at, like uh, everyone says, Armar should have went down and won. Another one, at least another one All Ireland. I would have felt equally that we were good enough to to win an All Ireland with that group, and I think it was that kind of you know that trust thing, or you know that would the, the you know the go with the try and uh, not the try and trust. I think it was the the horses for courses. I think just you know there was the following years there was a lot of tinkering around that didn't suit. You know what I mean? So um, it would look there was opportunities there we should have won, and on the day it's you know. Is it a bit of luck, or is it you know? Did they not have the the leadership to take that responsibility? You know, so it's, look, it's a hard to put your finger on it, but uh, I look on uh, fond memories, but I also look on it with a lot of regret as well. You know, do do you count two thousand three as regret or, or frustration? Because you know you you were playing against their man, Clucks and get sent off, and rather than taking off maybe a corner forward, you get taken off, and your man goes on to score four points after you were having a good game. Yeah, I suppose uh, disappointment. That that was being realistic. That was my last kind of uh, evolved, well I was involved the following year and then back in, and in 07 you know but um, I, you know I think there there was a lot of stuff that went on you know in relation to the pressure was on Tommy and that and you know for me it was it was you don't take your centre back off and as you just rightly said man goes on kicks forward and then, you know I, I've spoken to a few people over the years, and people always re- remember the fact that that that, that point of where Clucko you get sent off, and then you know you, the, my number is up, and you're being called ashore, and I'm having a conversation. So Tommy, I said, "What? I said, what's going on?" I said, "Like geezer starting to come into it." I said, "He's going to go on geezer and you know sit the sit down, sit the f down, and you know and that was that was it." And I suppose um, you know I think. Uh, we, like there was a, at the time where we were, we were like what I felt. We were told we overachieved in 03 or oh, no two. That was the word in 03 that was coming from the management. Or we overachieved. We didn't overachieve. We were a good side, and you know, fairness. Tommy came in. He changed things up, and you know, the players responded to it. But then it was all the different mind games and stuff after that. That, that kind of probably that's why you know it fell asunder in relation to 03 or 04 you know we were a good side they were was it what's how many points we were by half time was it four or five or i'm not sure we're, it's something like that i can't remember yeah that. yeah we were, we were up and we were in control of the game and you know you know as you like uh anyone tell you that if you if you go if you lose if you lose a player that you you have to get rid of you have to make sure your back line is staying solid and look i was I probably having according to some people i was having probably my best game for dublin you know, and that's I suppose, and that's my that was my last kind of real kind of star. Well, play for Dublin. I, I played. I started one or two challenge matches in no four, but it, but it was that it was just, you know I suppose um, there was words exchanged after that ma- after that match. So which probably you know 
didn't help myself, but I'm look. I am my own, I'm my I'm my own man, so I'm not gonna. I'm not a yes man, and you know I'm. I was. I would be. I would don't want any players to be yes yes players either. I want my own players to be at the team for themselves and stand up for themselves, and you know, and and not feel they have to say yes because I'm the manager, the coach. You no, know, if you have a certain belief and I want you to express it, you know, and and I remember having a conversation. I had a conversation with Geese or so I that uh you know. Joe Kern encouraged that they were all individual players, like, you know, you're Dermot Mars and you've McGrain, you Geese, or you're Bell, uh, all men who were very opinionated, very strong and, and well, strong willed. And he didn't want to impinge on their their philosophy or their beliefs and, and, and want them to be yes men, you know. So, like, there's a famous story that where Mars comes out and F's Geese are out of it because Giza wouldn't kick the ball in. And so your job, so Mars apparently, by all accounts said, Giza, you get the ball and you deliver it in. It's my job to win it. It's your job to give the ball in. That's it. And there you go. Like, that's, what you're, that's what you're looking for. So I suppose that from, from that point of view, I would have felt that's where, the, you know, I definitely didn't, wasn't going to change the way my beliefs and that. But look, there's different, look, there's different uh, scenarios where, where, where the manager of time felt where, where my, I was at and where, where I was not at, you know what I mean? So, but look, I know, I know myself. I was honest. I was honest in, my, in where I was coming from. You know, you you, you mentioned that after O two and all this talk of maybe you'd overachieved that mind games come in. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, I suppose like O uh, two, we we I suppose we we come on a crest of wave and the it was getting over the line from because we hadn't beaten Mead since ninety five and we had been I had, between ninety five and that time in two thousand two, I, I think I played in, I including replays between minor and under twenty one and senior. I played in I think it was eight Leinster finals or something like that. And we had good players, and you know, you know, the Tommy Kerr was was close, and he was like he was shafted in my opinion. What happened to him, and you know, and I suppose. Well, when we came in after that, then we Tommy came in and like Tommy Carr had introduced myself, you know Paddy. Well, Paddy came on up to me, like, but like in terms of like the Paddy Andrews, Colin Moran, you know Clucko, um, Shane Ryan. Like there's a lot of a lot of players that that would have broken in with Tommy Carr's era, and I suppose Tommy came in and brought in you know Alan Brogan and and uh, Paul Casey, Barry Callan, who were. Bread of fresh air, were fantastic players, and Johnny McNally, and you know we went and we won Leinster. I would have felt quite easily in the sense, you know, I know Wexford was a bit tight, but or like you put it, we were down. It was down Dr. Cullen Park. It was it was madness that day, but um, I would have felt that like, you know, we were on the cusp of something and a lot of positivity, and you know, and we were playing good football, and to go from being told. You know, you're great, go on, go and win and blah blah, to, or to go and achieve and fulfil your potential. The next thing you go and win Leinster, you're within a width of a post um, of going or going to or being a drawn match and, and going to an All Ireland final, um, and then the team who beats you in the semi final goes on to win it, and you're there. And the next thing, oh no, we overachieved. Like, you know, come on, you know, it, like just didn't sit well with me, didn't sit well with the players. You know, and that whereas you're going from one extreme to the other, where it was like, I want you to do this, you're, you're a mate, you're doing well, blah, blah. And then to go from saying, you know, like, just didn't sit, didn't sit well with me anyway, and it didn't sit well with other players as well. So I think that's where they kind of, it kind of, it kind of, uh, the seed was planted then, and I suppose was the trust then from the management of players and what, like, you know, what, um, and that's where like the different mind games come in, and I suppose where you look at all three. Where we played, we hammered loud in the first round, just the first round of championship, and uh, and he made. I think it was nine changes for the for the match against Leash in the semi final. I think uh, nine, and five Crokes players start, which shouldn't have been the case. Um, no, I'm not saying because it's just like the, the lads who were, like the lads were going well, and but like the, I don't think what the lad the, the nine different changes there was a few dro- lads being dropped. That I didn't think they weren't being dropped. That they were winning, beating level with fifteen points. Um, and I think you know you went the leash match then and a lot of change and a bit of uncertainty. And then look what happens then. Look, you get beaten and it's a different kettle of fish. Like so, I think from that point of view, you know, didn't help ourselves that way. You know. 
Being a Dublin player these days, I mean, it's the only show in town and I would say you're kind of probably not far behind Leinster players, even Leinster rugby right. players, that is, in terms of the profile you'd have around town and notoriety and sponsorship gigs and all that kind of stuff. Being a Dublin footballer back then, now, there was obviously huge attendances at your games and people, uh, scrutiny and hype and all that kind of stuff, but because the team didn't ultimately win in All-Ireland during that area era and you know Ray Cosgrove for example would have got so much focus for, for that ball hitting off the post I think even Mark Vaughan another club mate I'd say he probably had plenty of the wrong type of scrutiny as well even for yourself is it tough was it much tougher to be a Dublin footballer back then yeah well, I suppose it was uh, it was part and parcel I think it was part and parcel of what, what came with playing Dublin or being with Dublin because you had a shadow of the, well, 95 won, but the shadow of the 70s team and, you know, the scrutiny of, like, you know, I suppose the, we, the I think it was, I don't know who said it, we were the Man United of the GEA, like, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then, look, I suppose at the time when you look at it, you know, we are in the capital, papers need to be sold, you know, stories have, have, to, are, you know, have to be reported on. And I suppose in my point of view, you know, that's where, you know, like, I remember having a cut off. Um, a reporter before and I said you know he marked the panel out of, out of 10 right after we got knocked out of the championship and I've seen him in coppers and this is here I said I said, why didn't you mark anybody else, any of the other teams out of the country out of 10 I said what's your problem oh and, and he was gone so like you know so for me you know as we, we I was we go into work on, Monday, on a Monday morning and you know You've got people who have like having a cut off your else, but like I remember being time going down after we were beaten and going down Tampa Bar, and I remember Jay Jay O getting like an abuse and like, you know, you're just there to die, like, you know, well, like you know, while we're looking to play a bit of football and do our best, and uh, you know, I suppose there was always that kind of in the in the backgrounds, you knew that you were from a, an arm around the shoulder to get a kick in the backside, you know, and that that was all you're always. It was it was one or the other. It was either an arm round or well a pat in the back or a kick a kick up the hole. Excuse my language, but then, but that's the way it was. It was just like you know, just you. It was kind of you, you got used to that, and I suppose you would never. I never, well, I never really looked at the papers, you know. But it wasn't me. I didn't. I didn't. It didn't bother me as much, you know. I suppose, but it was. This was my my family, my, like my 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 mom and dad, and you know, and then being so involved with Kim O'Good, and then my family down in Wexford, and you know, my cousins or whatever ringing me and texting me says, "Do you see what that?" said about you or the lads and like you know like i suppose and i was at the park whereas you know it was the people of your your people who you loved that you you would kind of be annoyed the fact that they would get annoyed because they're protective of you obviously but um yeah there was there was a shadow there was always kind of a shadow over you but like you know i, I, had, a, I had an opportunity to have a, have a cut off one or two two reports <laughs> for the crack so you know what i mean so if they if they give it they can they can take it. and i actually had to go out a former player as well because he had a cut off his, um, in the paper as well, and he didn't like that. So we had a few words, and I said, like, you know, you're a former dub. I said, what are you doing? So, oh, you, I said, no, I said, yeah, well, you get paid for it. I said, look, you, you can't criticize. I said, you don't see Colm O'Rourke, or you don't see Peter Canavan, you don't, you don't see any of them criticizing their own, so, or Kerry lads, never. I said, so what are you doing? And he said, oh. But anyway, look, that's a, that's a different that's a different story. I, I read an interview you did with Kieran Cunningham a few years ago and you were talking about I miss the adrenaline, do I miss running out in front of Hill 16? Yes I do, would I give two fingers to be back there? Yes I would. Am I jealous and bitter that I was born in a different era? But like, so counterbalance that with a lot of the games you go to in the last few years, Dublin playing the Leinster Championship, it's, it's, it's almost funereal the atmosphere, There's, there could be 30,000 there and it just feels like it's empty. You had these unbelievable days, didn't always happen for you but it just felt more raucous. So those quotes in 2016, did it, is that still how you feel? Um, yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, look, I, yeah, definitely, look, I miss it. Um, to be born, and I suppose the enjoyment of running out in the fields, uh, like with a full house, it was amazing. Um, and I suppose it's a pity that the lads only get to experience that on the day of an all-earnings. But they, when, they, when you're putting medals in your backside pocket, you know, you know, still, am I still kind of jealous? Absolutely. I just I can't change, you know, and I'll never change that. And I suppose, but the other, in hindsight, you know, like this is no criticism towards anybody, you know, where the game is and the, the level of detail and coaching and, and 
stats and everything else. Uh, you know, we were talking to 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 lad, like Darren and and a few other like Cosy and that. Like, he's close to those lads, and you know, like, can you imagine the the, the what, how good we could have been if that level of kind of coaching had been employed to us at the time, or you know. Whereas I, that's what I find where you see now is where a lot of players now where, you know, they're they're coached, you know, so well. But what I also find that they're coached so coach well, they sometimes they struggle with the, the the instincts within the moment of oh well we didn't that didn't happen or there's a there's a situation where they haven't been in before or they can't read something straight away in front of them that it's been all programmed down to you know, well they've they've analyze the team they're playing they've analyzed the team with the player they're playing and something has happened that they haven't analyzed or something like that. and I find sometimes where you, where you see where he kind of struggles where it's one on one defending or where it, should he should he give the 60-40 pass he won't give the 60-40 pass because he's afraid of that 40% chance of losing the ball and then he's lost possession and that's a stat against him whereas I sometimes find that you know they say that they're, they're some Coaches are playing their player, players to be a little bit safer, which is, I get it, but in uh, the, the game for me is all about taking chances. Um, you know, you go out and you, you want to win, you have to take a chance to kick the ball or poke the ball long or, you know, in 60-40, like I trust if I was playing with you, Shane, and you're in the forward line, and if I give the ball 60-40 in your favour, I trust you, you should win that ball. As well as I go back to what Darren Marsden would have said to Giza your job to get the ball into me is my job to win it I suppose and that, that's where I kind of find you know which the game is uh, like has, has evolved massively and you have to evolve with it you know but I think the, where you can see where I think the difference in the top top teams with Dublin and, and Kerry um, where you can see you can see them playing the game and thinking in the moment and thinking their way through the game whereas see a lot of teams who are not being successful because we are trying to the emphasis on one Pacific or two specific game plans defensively and offensively and they don't step out away from that and when they where you see where Dublin can step away and they can play play in the moments where Dermot Connolly can split a ball or defence with the ball or you know what I mean or Pot Chain McCarthy can see when there's a gap to go through he'll go through it whereas I find with the other teams that might not see that because they're being coached probably over coached if you, if you, if you get what I'm saying I don't know if you but like another thing is is this whole idea of hype and then did you get enough coaching back then? So the teams now can feel a little bit stale at times when you're watching how processed some of the football is. Some of it's unbelievable to watch. But it's like, what what about the hype and what about the the type of coaching you would have got back then? Did that hold you back? Um, I suppose the, the the hype would have been. It was very hard to kind of ignore the hype. Um, it was you know like walking. I was working at VHI at the time um, in O two and. You know, Lower Abbey Street, and then I remember walking up to O'Connell Street. I was going for lunch, and I looked looked up, and here was a big, huge team photograph. I was around, I think, permanent TSB building or something. And I'm there, like, holy banana, like, what's going on here? You know, and and you know, I remember at, at the year previous, no one, I was in a, I was in, a, I was in a car crash with Lauren actually, and um, and it was two weeks out from the Leinster final, and you know, I. Didn't, like the, the the accident was in the paper, like the accident happened on I think it was the Wednesday or Thursday. Like it was in the it was on the it was on the back or the front of the Herald. Like you know you're, you're there like that. Like Jesus, you know. Like I didn't think it would be that. Like you would would not expect that to be being a GA player. Like oh, McGee's gonna miss is a deal with Leicester final in, in a car crash or something like that. Like you know, and you're there like that. So that's the kind of high. Well, I wouldn't call that hype, but I'm saying it's that media attention that you had and. I suppose, you know, we would have there were a lot of bit of paranoia where we were training in the Ables and stuff where gates were closed and you know, I suppose, you know, all you're looking to do is play a game of football. Um, and the hype thing I suppose didn't help that, you know, put bums and seats and or the man united, you know, that was probably you know, for a lot for a young lad coming in, you'll probably be a little bit daunting. But um in terms of the coaching and stuff, I suppose, you know, it was probably just of of the time. Do you know what I mean? I suppose at the time. You know, would we have done better with, with Mick O'Dwyer? I don't know, probably, you know what I mean? With the things, the way he was man to man manager, you know, um, and how he, how we hear the f- former Kerry players, the Clare players, and how he did, went in and, and dealt with players individually and Paddy O'Shea and how he handled. So, you know, would, would we have 
benefit more with somebody else, uh, probably. But um, I, I don't want to be too critical of, of, of anybody, you know. So when I was thinking of the hype, I kind of came across the whole Quentin Han fight, you know, when I was just doing a little bit of research. And for people who wouldn't have seen it back in the era, you did a charity fight. You raised a five-figure sum for Irish Autism Charity. But Quentin Han was a snooker player at the time. And I remember a bit of a hothead. I remember once or twice he'd get bored during a snooker match and just smash up all the reds which of course is not something you're supposed to do. But can you recall the story how in 2004, you're what, in your mid-twenties, how you end up in a, in basically a boxing match with this man? Yeah, I suppose it was, I got a phone call um, to say they want to earn money for charity and money for my, I do mean, and a few quid for myself. Um, and I said, yeah, why not? Like, you know what I mean? Um, and it just escalated from there. Now, like, you now the stuff around it, like, you know, I, I, I was supposed to turn up to, I was probably a bit naive. Tommy, like, Tommy Lyons stepped away as manager. There was no manager of Dublin at the time. So I probably was sort of probably a bit naive in the sense of taking the fight. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't train for it. <laughs> like, I, I did one sparring, I did one sparring session. Um, with with Austin Cruz, Michael Cruz's dad. Um, I was, I was, I was fighting out Jimny, Jimny Boxing Club, and uh, it was just crazy. Like your man, Quentin Hans' manager was just a different kettle of fish altogether. Um, like he wanted to, he went to throw water over me and stuff, or you know, like we wanted to need to sell to put bums and seats. And I said, hold on a second, I said, this is gone. You know, and I had signed up to it then, and I had agreed to it, and I couldn't back out of it. Cause we backed out of it then. It was like. You know, I was going to be the the windy GA player, and like that would that would that follow me around for the rest of my GA career. You know, and I was there. I was in a rock and a hair place, and like, but I suppose the the side stories to all that, that that leading up to that, like you know, I I was supposed to go into it this morning. It was a TV three morning in Ireland, wherever it was at the time, and. You know, after the stunt each other pulled with the water and everything else, I said, I'm not going in there. And he said, where he is? No, no, I'm grand, thanks. And I said, like, you know, like the, the different phone calls I got about, you know, what, what was I trying to fight? Uh, like, the difference, you know, just a different, different thing altogether. And I suppose it was, it was a joy day. I suppose the, what I, so I met Michael Cruz. He was a, look, an uh, uh, Irish sporting legend, uh, gold gold medal winner, and fascinating to hear his story face to face. You know, um, met uh, Steve Collins as well. He uh, Roddy had offered to help out as well at the time, and uh, met Steve. Uh, he was Moyes of Castle Knock and spent an hour and a half or something talking about the Chris Eubank fight. You know, so it was, you know, it was it was a surreal thing. But like, it was at the time I was. We were coached, we're doing well. Um, Mick Dillon was manager, um, and we were preparing for semi final and final for for Croaks. And, and that's where I couldn't, I you know, like we hadn't won a championship since '98, and like, you know, probably more naive, probably stupid, more to be honest with you, but that I didn't do anything where your man had been over the previous six weeks and, and trained, and he, you know, he had fought before, he trained before, whereas I would look. I was only ever did a bit of kickboxing when I was in my early teens, and I suppose um, hindsight, probably you know, would I do it again? Probably not, but uh, or else it was to do again, it would be a bit more training. But it was, it was just, it was a surreal thing. It was just um, the different things that were going on around that. And but my fo- sole focus was Kim Good, like because we, you know, I mean, look, we went, we won the championship that year, and that was the, that was my main goal. And like the team was, we were playing, was the, we played a match or. Championship match or a league match or something, and I broke my nose two weeks out from the fight or something. And sure, sure, the first time he smacked me, like sure, you couldn't miss my nose the size of it anyway. So like, but uh, he, but yeah, but he broke like my nose just start busted up. But look, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy, you know. Um, and like you know, you could, you could see. I think it's. Uh, I, I've seen it back in this. You know, I should, here I am. I should have trained for it, and I should have done a bit of basics for it. But like, I didn't at all. Like, you know, we've had it been a, a, a UFC fight, I would have, you know, probably done a lot better than what I did. But it was, it was definitely mad. It was a mad time, and it was just like it was like the, during the the boom or the, you know the Celtic Tiger, and it was just like the you know, the hype around everything. It was you know, escalated, and there was money being thrown everywhere. And well, at the time, like, but like the. 
being offered I remember I got a phone call um, to what was it, to throw the fight but anyway, I didn't know this person got a, and uh, he said do you want to throw the fight uh, no you're alright thanks do you know what I mean it's, you know uh, like crazy stuff I'm trying to I'm trying to picture what it must have been like for you standing up there ready for the bell to go for the you know for the start of the fight yeah. and the reports I've heard from people is it was a bit of a boozy environment 500 people in there and the place going crackers all together and that one of your teammates even tried to get into the ring at some stage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, was, it was surreal. Um, it was it a was good atmosphere. Uh, like, you know, a lot of my family and friends are there and then teammates. And it was Paul Curran at the end when, when, the, when the flight ended. <laughs> he ran and he slid in underneath the bottom rope. Everyone's over to me and grabs me and gives me a kiss. I think, and uh, you know, one of the referees, our fishes, was trying to usher him out. Thought it was he was trying to attack me or something. But uh, yeah, it was funny. Like and you know, the lads up in the res, up in the well, the suppose the VIP, Jo and Senna and and uh, Darren Homer and a few others. But uh, look, it was the atmosphere. I suppose look, very daunting. Never like you know. I suppose it was probably the maddest. I'd say the maddest twenty minutes. Of my life, it was just to be in this restroom to okay, putting the glow and the tape, my hands taped up and the gloves on, and you know, and then I remember being in before the fight, and uh, you know, I had got gloves, um, they were sponsored by I think or something dumb, get was gloves to wear, and the gloves were that he got where to match, like you know, I was wearing I think blue and white or something, and uh, he was wearing wearing red and black, and uh. But the gloves he got were were a sharper cut, or, and they weren't they weren't as padded, and like my group, no way, not a chance. Of it. I says no, need to change the gloves up, and like I'm sitting there, like you know, about to go out into a fight where I never fought before, and you know that was thrown in, and you know, very very lonely place when you're standing in the, in the ring and you've never been in the ring before in your life, you know, uh, and you can only use your fist. And there was a there was a time where it was the first thirty seconds where I like I punched myself out in relation to. You know, I hadn't trained for it, and I had him over the rope, and my my instinct, I, I went to, to to knee him, and my instinct was to kind of knee him or throw a boot, and referee, Johnny, Johnny, you can't do that, you can't do it, because he see me bringing the knee up, and I said, you know, I said, Johnny, you can't be doing that, and I said, okay, right, so, so my, you know, my natural instinct of to kind of, you know, just strike, with, you know, while I had him, I had him over the rope, I was trying to push him out over the thing. It was just kind of, and that's where I suppose it was just the adrenaline a whole lot. I mean, thinking back in the hour, you know, instead of rushing out and just kind of going mad at him, I just I should have kind of settled myself and just kind of picked the pick my way through. But uh, yeah, look, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. Now, come on, f- funny, funny at the end of the night now, fairness, but it was crazy. You won the fight on points though, and well, I, I, wish, yeah, I think it was a home down decision. <laughs> yeah, it might have been, but for you, was it important to like? The reason that you were windmilling towards the end and making sure to get in as many hits and make obviously make enough an impact to get the decision was any of that down to you couldn't face the the slagging afterwards that you had to give everything. Yeah, absolutely. Look at me. I, I, I was in a, as I said, in a rock and a hair place, and I think uh, initially I think it was Graham Cardi was supposed to choose to fight because uh, he'd been slagging off or his footballers and stuff. And I suppose I was the next phone call was myself, and there was no way it was not going to. Well, on uh, like you know, giving my my all, you know, and like when I look back in the fight, look, there's a time where I'm cringing, I'm looking at it, yeah, and I'm there. But just when I did connect, I did connect with him, and but you know, I think uh, it was just it was just um, the fact that you know it being so publicised. You know, there was a good crowd of five hundred people there, but like you know, I suppose the fact of getting the decision, you know. Where people like the people with a better box than I would have said, Johnny, you were, that was lucky. You were lucky that you got that one. But look, come here. I still got it. Um, probably a hometown decision. But, you know, uh, there was a, like, you know, I, there's there's other side stories that I could tell you. But I, like, after, I, like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't take one record and tell them what, what, what they were, you know, because uh, I'd be afraid of getting into trouble myself. Did that, did that affect your Dublin career at all, doing something as high profile as that? Um, I would have liked to think not, but you know, the people did people look at me a different light, I don't know. Um, but I would have always felt well, I would have always felt they did my talking on the fields and you know, uh, I'm very lucky to play with Kim McCord and be very successful, well, 
relatively successful and that time of when Tommy stepped away we won two Dublin titles in a row won a Leinster title um, should have won the All-Ireland in 05 and, you know, but we didn't but like you know that's the time Pillar took over um, from Tommy and I suppose the night of the old tree the Armad thing go back to Armad like myself and Pillar had a few friendly words in old tree after the Armad game about being taken off and you know maybe you look was it that was that you know the first two years of Pillar took over he dropped me off the panel and brought me back in 07 and then it was gone again in 08 but it was probably the best thing that I was went back to the club and I I I had contemplated on on hanging the boots up um, after 08 or after being involved in 07 and you know I'd been back training with with the squad for the 08 season and got the phone call from Pillar. Um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't. I I told him what I thought. Told him that there was players out there that he had been out there for, that had been out there for three, three years or who still hadn't played or started the championship match or were regulars and they were still out there. And so like, you know, so it was a pretty honest conversation. But I suppose in saying that now it was pretty, you know, in a kind of a dark place at the time. Um and so I um you know, I suppose the going into then thinking about stepping away, you know, because Dublin was I had the two years of being away from Dublin, you know, I it was like a death. Um, and here was facing it again, and like I, I put a lot of effort into 07 and was playing some some playing some, playing some good football, you know, in, in the training games, the A and B matches, um, and I was playing playing very well, and still wasn't getting a look in, and like I, you know, I had said when Pillar brought me back, like you know, I, I said I don't want to be wasting your time and my time, and like, I want a fair crack at rip, and you know, Pillar has his reason of didn't, but like you know, I would have felt that I could have got a better opportunity and I suppose then facing then of being dropped off the Dublin team um, for the you know for the second time, you know, whereas I didn't felt I didn't get a fair crack of the whip on the you know the 07. I was there at that, you know, what's the point? Um and then Tom, Paddy Carr took over Crokes and he says, Look Johnny, is it we want you to be captain and we feel you've a huge role to play for us for Kim O'Cud and I suppose you know, I didn't. I didn't really. You know, I suppose over oh five, oh six, I, I really my my estimation of the of the club player really elevated. Um, and then obviously when I finished or oh eight onwards, in relation to what they had to deal with, um, because look, I spent all my summers training with Dublin and going back in for the business and the championship with Kim O'Connor. I you know, didn't really appreciate the the effort that they were they were doing. But in fairness to them, look, they, that was the one thing I always felt when we came back from Dublin with with Darren and Cosy, and was that we were always coming back to win championships. And it was like there was no we weren't going on holidays. You know, we were coming back in and we were winning the championships. Um, that was our that was our goal. But that was that was that was bred into us from when we and Ray were brought into the Crokes team at a young age. The likes of Peter Ward and these guys were, you know, Robbie Lee's were telling us like, you know, there's a standard here for Kendall Cod, and that was what we were. That we, we were. That was what we what we came back to, you know. So when you were reflecting in another interview about Croaks, you said at Croaks we were a band of brothers, no question about it. You always knew your teammates would step up. They had your back. With Dublin, I could only say the same for a handful of lads. What do you, like? You probably don't want to single people out there, but in what way did that manifest itself? I suppose I, I, that's where I would have felt, you know, that um, I would have felt at any given time. Then we there was a times when stuff when the, the shit hit the fans, you know, and you know, you if I was to leave, if, if someone was to leave a player to go to another player to double team or something like that, there was like there was a trust that I could you would automatically be picked up if playing with chemical code. There wasn't that that case. I would have felt with Dublin at times where you know where you were trying to do, you were told to help out your teammate, but then there was other lads minding themselves, and that's where I would have felt that you know, there were lads probably agree or disagree with me on this, but look, I'm I'm only being honest. I would have felt like you know with Kim O'Cod, I would have known that at any given time if I was leave my my man to go to someone else, or you, Shane, if you would leave your man to go to someone else, your would have man would have been picked up straight away, and there was not. There was not your man with the ball was going to pop your man and he would have got the score or would have picked the pass to, to, for the ball to go inside for a goal or you know that type of thing whereas where you would have seen like that kind of stuff where, where I would have seen this 
you know, when, uh, when Gilroy took over, you would have seen the transition from where they were to where they ended up in 2011 when they won the All-Ireland, where it, Gilroy had broken broken down, went back to basics, you know, was that questioning everybody, you know, how much was this, how much how much is it for you to be want to be a Dublin player, how much are you willing to go, how far are you going to go to? And you would have looked at the last 10 minutes of that All-Ireland final in 2011 where Kerry made a couple of mistakes. Dublin were probably, they weren't the better team on the day, but never give up. And then when it came to the opportunity, like they were very nervous, when it came to the opportunity in the last 10 minutes, the, the mistakes that Kerry coughed up, Dublin capitalised and punished. And I think it was from what Gilroy learned his lesson, like, you know, to the individuals that what I would have felt that would have been in that, over that time period, my time period, and maybe at whenever, when I finished, you know, where it was, you know, Player, certain players wouldn't, if they didn't play well, they were still left on the field. Do you know what I mean? That type of thing. Um, whereas there was no individuals in that group that Gilroy, he, that he transformed into. And you look what that transpired into after that. Um, and I would have always felt like with Kimmel Code that we, we had that, that kind of standard of within the group with each other. And like, and that was the thing is like for me it was, I often said to the lads as captain, I said, lads, it doesn't make a difference who is the manager or who who is going to be the manager of us. Just look around you, look at the talent we have here. As a, at the end of the day, when we cross the white line, it's up to us. So, like, look what we have. You know, let's make sure we utilize. You know, I, I still believe. Look, we should have won another, at least one or two all earns of that group I was with, and we didn't. And look, I suppose it was like you. You know, get beat by Salt Hill, and uh, and then we learn our lessons, and then two years later or three years later we win the thing. You know, and but the lessons of it felt like sometimes you have to learn a lesson before you you, you rectify it. And I think mean, that trust thing was was a big thing for me. It was where I would have found at stages where you know there was not just myself, but where fellas were sticking to what they were told. And if you were going to help out a teammate, you were allowed to help out a teammate. But the nearest guy to you was to step up, and that didn't happen. And you would have seen, I would have, you would see it in some of the plays or like the different games where you could see that, that those situations happening where one guy is going to the man on the ball because he was he might have slipped Johnny. So if, if for example, John McEntee slips Johnny, well then uh, Paul Casey or Pat Andrews was coming across to McEntee, you know, but he was picking up Paul Casey's man or Patter's man. And that's where you know, you know, that's the, the type of thing I'm talking about was that kind of that real kind of trust where you know you can sacrifice yourself to 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 read a situation and sense the danger, and you know you can trust the guy who's going to cover you. And I felt that's the that's the type of thing I'm on about where that I would have felt that that didn't happen enough. Whether it was that down to the management or it was down to players or you know was it there how we were you know was it down to lads like being just minding their own 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 spot do you know what I mean or minding their own player and not having to worry whereas like you know my philosophy is like I don't care who scores who he score I don't care or uh, for us I don't care who like who gets the block in or who turns the man over once we don't concede the score you know so we're it's a, as one if, if, if that, does, that make, does that make sense to you yeah absolutely but I, I wonder from listening to you do you, um, do you look back on your Dublin career overall fondly or does it gnaw away at you I, I listen. I uh, I do look back at it funny, uh, but there's look. I, I'd be lying to you if I said it, it, it gnaws away at me, like you know. And should like I suppose just pe- like people say, I should should I forget about it? Listen, look. I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't if it didn't gnaw away as me a small bit. So you know, I suppose for me, it's just trying to you know pass on what I experienced uh, to 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 anyone and whoever I'm involved with, or you know, um, what experience I can and. Listen, there was probably the best days of my, you know, some of the best days of my career and life in the Dublin jersey, and you know, walking out in front of Hill Sixteen and Crow Park is full, and and you know, and you know, there's no better feeling in the world, like you know, hairs on, on the back of your neck, you know, standing still, and yeah, I do look fondly on it. Like I played, look, as I said to you, I played from from the age of ten on Dublin teams all the way through, you know, minor, uh, twenty one, senior. So, like you know, it was it was a huge privilege and honor, and yeah, I do. I look back and I finally absolutely, but I still have look. I still have regret. I still have you know, what if, um, and I suppose from that then, like 
that what ifs are trying to impose that then in and like managing our culture and philosophy and you know when I'm dealing with different situations, you know. Just I, I, I presume the club um, run you had winning the All Ireland as captain in two thousand and nine. I presume that makes up for the fact that you had so much success there. I know, absolutely, yeah. I think um, it was you know when you ask someone to like, did you fulfil your dream? Like you know, people's dreams are different. Uh, my dream was to win an All Ireland with Dublin, um, to captain Dublin to an All Ireland, and my the other dream was to win to win captain my club team to an All Ireland. And to say I've achieved that, you know, there's not very many people that can say they they fulfil their dreams, you know, and it was a huge sense of fulfillment and relief um you know because we had been knocking on the door with that team for a good few years and we had a quality side and i i felt we would have under, underachieved as a, as a group even though look very lucky to to have won what i've won with with, with the club but um yeah it was it was just a i suppose at the time where i like i'm living in ashburn was it 15 years now so i would like for the cuts of seven years i was traveling back and forth from ashburn to train with croaks and um, to be a part of the be a captain to win at that time, it was massive. Um, but like it was the was the dealing with the different pressures of you know of what went from force of learning from our lessons and that sense of of achievement. But even to go to the steps then and and even though. Like, or to share with my two daughters was massive. You know, I had Lauren in one hand and I had Dave in the other. You know, and to be able to to to, to share that, like, there's a lovely, lovely photograph of it. Um, like, just like I suppose it's, I, I still get kind of a little bit emotional thinking about it still. You know, because you know it's it's the one thing that you you know when you you win something with your mates and your friends and like we had a ten year reunion only there, there last March, whatever it was. Oh, no, sorry, last year. And uh, it was lovely uh, to see the lads again and uh, just to reminisce. And I suppose the for me it was kind of you know to be a part of that and to be able to say, look, you know, I, yes, I didn't probably win as as an All Ireland with Dublin or should have won more with Dublin, but look, I was part of an era with Kim O'Cord and I like to think uh, you know I was a, a part of that wheel that helped bring success to the club like as well as the other all the other teammates you know but i was a part of a team that helped get, get us to that to that to that spot where we're still trying to get back to you know and during the middle of it all on that run you were actually you were getting married weren't you so that kind of interrupted your run <laughs> yeah oh come here i remember paddy saying to me i remember saying to paddy i said look i get married uh december uh the 4th of december and uh he said like and he said, Johnny, just to let you know, look, if all things gone well, that's going to be in between the quarterfinal or the semi-final, uh, Leinster. And this is um, oh, sorry, no, sorry, it's the Thursday. Sorry, it was the Thursday before the Leinster final. And but my stag was that's what it was. My stag was the weekend. So the quarterfinal was on the quarterfinal. Then the following week was the stag weekend, and the following week was the semi-final. So yeah, it was. Look, it was. Now, come here. I was delighted. I was still trying and playing away because, like, in fairness to herself, she was organising everything. And <laughs> the only thing I had to do was organize, collect the, the math booklets. That was all I had to do. So everything else was sorted. But, but it was, a, yeah, it was, I suppose it was a straight, it was a funny time. Um, my, my grandfather wasn't well. Um, couldn't go to the, to the wedding. Then he died. He died. Then the prior to the semi final, was it the semi final or the yeah the semi final? Um, yeah, but the, I suppose I didn't go on. The, I didn't go on my stag. You know that was you know, Darren booked the, the stag at Newcastle. Um, and Paddy, look, I remember having a conversation with Paddy, and Paddy said, "Look, John," I said, "Like I know." I said to Paddy, "Look, my stag is in, is on this this date, and this is prior to getting out of Dublin." And he said, "Oh, okay. We look. We did when it comes to that, and you know." We win Dublin, and we win the quarter final, and then you know, Paddy, my stag is next weekend, buddy. Is it? Um, I said, Jenny, look, I can't get down you to go because you're the captain. And I said, Jesus, Paddy, I said, oh, you know you can't. I said, look, I know you can't kind of support, but like, oh, this is being planned over in a year in advance. Like, this is not intention. This is not. You know. And he's looked at me. I can't look. I'll be honest with you. I can't get down you to go. So we, I can't give you my permission. And 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 like, back, Paddy being cute, like. Look, I leave it. I leave it up to you, Johnny, and I know you come up with the right decision. 
And then that was it. <laughs> there it was. I was. Oh my god. So didn't go on the stack there, and we really didn't go on the stack. Um, and you know, uh, do we regret? Absolutely not. Like won the, you know, win, won the semi final, and then go win the Leinster final, and then you know what transpired into it. Like so, you know, my my I got married on the December, so I remember the wedding was on the Sundays. Or sorry, the, the wedding was on the Thursday. The wedding was on the or the, the match was on the Sunday, and uh, didn't didn't well sorry, that's a lie. Had a glass of champagne, and then I had uh, a large bottle of bombers to day my wedding. So and then the rest of the lads were on the dry. And I remember Darren. Remember Darren. This is why it's like remember me and Darren were pulled aside by Paddy and, and Mark Duncan and Jerry and like you know, so Darren, you can't have you can't have a drink. <laughs> If I want to drink my brother's wedding, I'm going to have a drink my brother's wedding. I'm going to look at that and just hold the horses, relax. So, but like, I can understand where they're like, you know, I suppose it was the for, I was forced, to, I forced of my family to get married. You know, I'm the eldest uh, of my family, and then the eldest kind of grandson or the eldest grandson in, uh, on both sides of my parents. So it was a big thing. <laughs> also, his look, I said, Paddy, look, I talked to him. So, obviously, in the car, you know, on the way home and spoke to him and look at transport. Look, we did, uh, the lads who went to the, to the wedding didn't didn't drink. And Paddy always has a great story. Like, you know, it, normally it's the women trying to drag the men home, but this time it was the men trying to drag the women home. So, it was, uh, yeah, look, it all added to the, you know, to the, to the whole occasion. And then I remember being in the airport, I was flying out on the Monday morning. After the lens of fire from my from my honeymoon, and uh, I remember Brian Kavanagh and Lee Moog <laughs> ringing me at seven o'clock in the morning, and they were still in, still in coppers, <laughs> singing down the phone to me. We all dream of a team of Johnny McGee's, I think, or something like that. But it was, you know, it was funny, you know. And like in fairness, my wife she she said, "Look, I'm picking you up at, at, at half twelve. I said, this was at eight o'clock. I said, you got eight o'clock to half twelve, and then we're out because there's no way you'd be able to go on the plane." And I said. Um, I had, we were going to Cancun, so it was like you know. So in fairness, look, it was it was yeah. Look, it all added to it. But like it was it was strange. Like you know, I suppose at the time, like Shane, it was at the time like we got married. Sorry, winning the All Ireland, right? So we got married December of four, the fourth of December, won Leinster. Then in January of nine, my wife gets made redundant because of the the bang had come. So you made redundant. Then I was maybe done it the day before the All Ireland final. I finished up my job and the, uh, the day before the All Ireland final, Paddy's Day. Yeah, that was so within the space of four months from going from from being married and having the joys to you know to the biggest day of my football career and the day before you lose your job and my wife was maybe done it and the uncertainty of everything and and the, you know and then the the, the bang hit and you know the, and what came after that then was you know. You know, what, like recession, and you know, lucky that we kept the whole of our house and all that kind of stuff. But like, it was just those four months was surreal. Like, although well, that period of time was, was, was you know, stressful but enjoyable. If you don't get me, you know, it was the happiest time being able to experience that. But then it was, you know, in the background, like the, what was going on in the background, you know, losing our jobs and not the security of the house, and could we do a deal with the, with the building society and stuff? And that was just, you know, it brought you down to. The few days after the All Ireland was great, but then you you know you, you saw it pretty quickly. Then within the next few days, because it was back to reality. Then you know when you jump ten years on and you're part of the management team with Kilmacud that wins the county title. Then when you go on and the Mullinyakta game happens and you're the giant that gets killed, does that like was part of that just the focus from the country and the fact that the, it felt like everyone was delighted to see you lose because you were the big city team. Yeah, look, I suppose you now come here. I, I came close to bouncing a remote control off the win, off the telly because um, it was. I suppose, look, come here. It was a fantastic story, you know, David Goliath and all the kind of stuff, and you know, uh, but like, you know, I was for the next five days, like, you know, I was sitting. I remember sitting. It was with Freud. It was the Friday after. So I think was, there was Friday. Yeah, they were on the Late Late Show. I mean, then the Saturday night then around the, the Ireland Sports Awards or something like that. I was, I was sitting there and I think, are they, so I knew, I just, I'm, I'm gone, out the door, down to down to the, down to Dunhamore Ashburn GA Club and, and had a few points because it was just, and like, come here, listen, I, come here, I can shut myself off, mate, but I, felt, I really felt for the lads because, you know, 
they had put in such a massive effort. Um, and you know, we're, we're a young so a young team, like and they like we hadn't won the county title in, in, in I think it was eight years or something back when Lens final and, and uh you know and Mullen Lock there were, were like you know they didn't get the credit in in, in the build up to it as they should have. You know, they'd been three years, won the three in a row. They 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 every each year they progressed in Leinster. You know, they only beat by a point by, by Vincent the year previous. So the credit like, you know, there was a lot of stuff that people didn't get them the respect. Now we were paid them respect, you know. Um we were a bit naive in the last ten minutes of the match we were naive in how we how we played that match out. You know, we were trying instead of kinda of kicking on, we were trying to I think our lads kinda of, excuse me, just trying to play trying to play safe and see the game out where, you know, we had never asked the lads to do that. Whereas, you know, I think, and that's where the bit of inexper- a bit of inexperience of that group, but where, you know, we had an opportunity to kick on and, and probably, you know, put the game to bed. But like, you know, I suppose when, when you can see the penalty um, and then after the penalty, you, could, you know, we could, they can see the points. So from being three points up to a point down in the space of a couple of minutes, Free hard for 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 a team to come bounce back from that, particularly a, a team that mightn't have been, or wouldn't been as experienced, you know, as previous Crocs teams that might have been able to handle that or been cute enough to 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 you know to, to close out. And you look at where there was times there where our players were, you know, there was tournament man tackling. Well, look, look, it happens all the time, but it was there was no overemphasis on it, and like, there was no protection there for 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 our players. But look. It is what it is. We should have won the match. We didn't. Fair play to Mullen Knocked it. They, they, the, the game was for 60 odd minutes. They played at the very end and then they won it. So, like, you know, that's it's a bitter pill to swallow um, as a manager and coach and and, uh, and a, a particular player. And as I said, the, the lads, you know, that you know, don't let this define you. Um, and that was the one thing, I suppose, uh, from previous club teams I was on, like, you know, where we going to be defined by different different times of being beaten. and you know, definitely not like you know the Airog saga. You know, it took us was it six years to come back from that one. Uh, to win another took them time. So I suppose I'm just trying to get the lads to you know, like let's not be over caught up in it. Yes, it was it was difficult, and you couldn't get away from it from that period of time. Where it's like the social media and stuff, where it was like every was in it. it was come here, it was just in it was everywhere, and I suppose crawl into that hole and had come out for a few weeks. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, but yeah, it was it was difficult to take. It was a di- di- bit of pill to swallow. But look, I suppose it's part and parcel of, of football. And as I said to the lads, I said, look, you know, I said, hold on to that hurt because uh, like there was one thing I always held on to from that hurt of, of ninety eight with the three games with Airog where we left it behind us and that 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 really kind of got under my skin. And I suppose that you know, it goes against what psychologists tell you. You know, you shouldn't use being hurt or losing to be a motivation to win, I think they, they should be. You'd be more positive. Was, look, for me, it was it was one one defining thing for me was that like, there's no way am I gonna let this? I'm not gonna go without winning all Ireland here. And like we had a, that team held each other accountable a lot of stuff. And you know, if you look at very old, they're very successful in, in, in Leinster and how many county t- or Leinster titles they won. But what they asked, what they swap, that was never title for one all Ireland. Absolutely. So. No, I suppose that's. But I like to think that the lads, the lads we have, will will come back from it. You know, hopefully sooner rather than later. A quick word on managing Wicklow. So you took over age thirty six. So there was something like six years ago. What was what was that journey like? Yeah, I suppose um, I was a coach and selector the year previous. Um, and they look at transport that the, you know they got on very well. The players, the you know. At the time, Harry Murphy's manager, he liked my way of wanting to play football and philosophy of, of style. And you know, I suppose Harry was uh, looking to stay on, and with the view of like with me, and but I think the the county board were only going to give him one year or something, and he had to go apply for to be interviewed or something, whatever. I'm not sure what way it panned out, but I said, look, at me, the the next thing I first knew we were staying, and Harry, I mean, look, I'm, I'm pulling the plug, and I said, look, don't just look, we 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 brought in new debuts, and look, very Harry felt he said he had to go, and then I got a few phone calls from a few other players, look, Johnny, would you put your name forward, and it's look, I'm not put my name forward unless I get the approval from Harry, as Harry brought me under his umbrella, and Frank Harry and said, Jesus, look, if you're I'd like rather see you get it than somebody else get it, so that was the way it happened, and you know, look, it was. It was a, it was a, you know, got to know some fantastic people. It was a massive experience, you know, 
experience, you know, a valuable experience in my in my opinion. You know, got to got to get to see the game from a different light, different angle. Got to know some great people. Um, but look, it was highlighted to me like the 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 big the, the big gap between that the you know what what what, what the so called weaker and the the top table are you know it's, that's what kind of stood out to me and the different ways of how you how you meant to build a team or progress a team when there's such a gap of what, five or six months between the last time they played and to the next time they played officially I mean that that's the big thing for me where you spend so much of the time and you know and it was no coincidence like you know our best performances came in the in I well, I know we were beaten but uh, like you were against Mead and against Leash and against um I think it was loud and the our first our first round matches in Leinster like we we were lucky against Mead um, and Leash, you know. Whereas for me, it took that that time to get the lads up to that that level of fitness and playing together because they had been away from each other for the guts of was it five or six months. And I think that's the big thing where how can you expect to build teams when there there's such a gap in their in in, in their year of preparation, you know. Um, and that's that's where I found it was difficult to do, to try and get that to get that balance right, you know, because you don't like the lads are going back at different setups, and so it's just a kind of whereas you look in Dublin or the teams who are playing at at a higher level and they're they they're playing up until the end of August September they take their six weeks break or whatever the case may be and they were like within six weeks they're back to where they were near enough to where they finished. Do you know what I mean? And that's where whereas the difference is you're dealing with months rather than weeks. Do you know what I mean? So that that was that's what I felt, you know, that was the the big grow for me was the mental work that those lads put in and, and always willing to put it in and and then you go back to the drawing board again and all the work that you worked on the previous season has gone out the window, you're starting from scratch. So and then there's fellas who might want to commit or, you know, or they don't want to play and they're retiring or so they're like when you're trying to get a conveyor belt going. So look, it's it, look, it was a huge experience, you know. And for your former uh, Dublin teammate uh, Desi Farley's after taking over Dublin this year, five league games, two wins, two draws, and a loss. Coming in as manager in the first year in your own right at a senior level, I presume there's sort of a learning curve that's going to happen. And also in his case, he's taken over a team that's already created history. So there's a couple of reasons why it's probably a tough time for him to take over. Yeah, look, absolutely. Look, I suppose um, you could say it's the poison chalice um, taken over of a team that would like Harry would have been fairly successful. I would have got them promoted, we club promoted, and then you look at Jim got like the only deal with Dublin. I suppose you, you, the, there's a lot of pressure there in relation to trying to get lads to think uh, of your philosophy and what you're about. So, like, I would that was the one thing I would have. I would like to come. To, I would like to deal with players one on like you know speak to them and not be kind of um, a dictator, you know, um, or afford to like try not to dictate the players. Obviously, look, you have to have your certain principles and guidelines and what you want to, you, yeah, are certain rules and stuff. But like, you know, I want lads, I don't want lads to go and win a match for me. You know what I mean? I, I want the lads going to win them for, for themselves, the, the player beside them, then the team, you know, and from that point of view, like, you know, the pressure of trying to get, get those lads to buy into something that they can't see. Do you know what I mean? I suppose it's from a wicked perspective. Okay, lads, this is what I want you to. This is what we could achieve. Is it is it is it a realistic goal? I think it is. But when when it, when there has been so much success, you know, it's very hard to sell it and say, look, these are what's required, or you know, to get you to that level. You know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And I suppose for Desi, you know, he was coming in different pressures in the sense of you know. Okay, I can't change up too much because they've been so successful, in and it's just a balancing act that he's, he's trying to. He, I, I would have. Well, I'm in those shoes. I'll be a balancing act. Okay, how do you? The lads have played at such a high level. The consistency in in their performances has been top drawer, and you you don't come in to change much up, and you're just trying to come in. And, and Desi would have accumulated a lot of respect, pre obviously being a previous player, but also with a lot of respect in relation to this underage success that he would have had with, with the likes of Kieran Kilkenny, Paul Manning and these guys. So he would that would have carried a lot of respect coming into that, you know. So I'd say it is difficult, but I'd say look, Desi he's the type of character that he is, he's his own man. Like he'd be he's more than capable to handle it. And look he's 
Mick Alvin in there, you're like there's the one thing I'd always like when you're doing a job is to surround yourself with people who you can trust 110% and, uh, and always have your back. But the other thing is, it's not just about the trust, is the football philosophy. The same the same idea of football, whereas if you're looking at something, I know if I'm looking at a game and I'm watching it and I know if, uh, if I miss something, I know if ba- Robbie Brennan or Baggio will see it, I know he's seeing what I'm uh, like he's going to see what I'm saying or if I see something that I oh, don't have yeah, yeah. so you, you you have that kind of you know thing where you can bounce things off each other and you know that it's in the same frame, mind frame of what you want you know as, as a football manager or coach you know. a final question then about yeah. watching your daughter uh, Lauren win in All-Ireland you know 2017 they put three years of losing All-Ireland finals behind them to go and win it and she was quoted as saying, I was obviously emotional, but dad was roaring and crying. And he'd be a bit of a crier compared to my uncle. And uh, just emotional and stuff like that. Uh, must be, what's it like watching your daughter? Yeah, I suppose a huge amount of immense pride. Um, like, uh, I suppose, like, you know, I've got four girls. Lauren's the eldest of four. Um, you know, Ava, uh, you know, she's 14. And, She's a good little footballer and she's been on a couple of the me development panels and but um and then you're a smaller two or nine and seven around there were coming away up as well. So you can see there's a there's a bit about them you know, that they've a bit of a tension. But like, I suppose being such a young dad, um bringing Lauren down to the academy in Croaks on a Saturday morning and I remember they got Conor Deagon's daughter started at the same time and they both of them standing there yapping and he ends up with Diego looking at each other. Where you go run to the ball, so it was a couple of years of that, you know. Whereas, um, and that's where I suppose a huge credit, as I said already, here, like to my wife Lindsay and my mom and dad, you know, that some of the mornings I couldn't do because I was playing and stuff. But uh, and then with training and matches, you know, the, between the, the lotto's, you know, she was she progressed, and you could see there was something about her that she she you know the, she had the potential, and you know I suppose the getting over the line that time yeah I was emotional because I suppose you know um, for her to put so she put a lot of effort into it the year previous she had broken into, t- into the team and they were beaten by Cork by a point or something and the, look I suppose the my father or the instincts of her father wanted to run out because she was sitting on the ground and you could see she was physically upset and I wanted to just scale the, the wall and go over pick her up and carry her out Crow Park and you know what I mean? Just the, the, the protective instinct kicked in, and I suppose the emotion then of them winning and getting across the line and seeing her. And like, I suppose I've got a lovely photograph of actually um, of when she makes a beeline to me, and I suppose it was captured, which is, you know, something I'll never forget. Like, and it was just to kind of see one of your own, your own flesh and blood, blood excuse me, um, to, to fulfill her dream and her passion, you know. Um, that like you know, I would if the kids wanted to go and play tiddlywinks, I support them, you know. And I suppose to, to see Lauren and my kids wanting to play GA and her achieve the you know to that to get across that line of winning all Ireland. I suppose the emotion of my daughter winning it and winning it with Dublin and and how they went about it. And uh, I suppose the year previous of the hurt that had seen her and how upset she was to to be able to experience that. I suppose immensely proud. Um, and as I've said it before, you know, I'm happily, I'm happily to, to say that if for me not winning all Ireland meant for her to win in all Ireland, you know, uh, I don't think there would be, I don't think it would have been top by if that, that, that the feeling of that first, that, that first day when they won the all Ireland and that, that, that first day of the first embrace of when she ran over to us was massive. Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty emotional. I would look over, I'm, I wear my heart, my sleeve. You know, I, I say, I call as I say, and you know, I, and my emotions sometimes get get, get to the better. But look, that's for me. There's different ways about it, and you know, I suppose you know, different different people are different. You know, Jim Gavin was different. You know, Desi be different. You know, you look at Jurgen Klopp and how passionate and he just had to show his emotion. Look, people are different. Like you know, for me, it's just you, I, it's what you see is what you get. And at least then you know then. You know, you're, I'm being honest, and you know, uh, no one can say I was ever lying or anything like that. And people may agree with me or not, because it's creepy, but at least I'm, I'm honest to myself. But yeah, look, it was massive. It was, yeah, it was uh, pretty emotional. Well, look, it's a lovely note to finish off on. Johnny, you've been brilliant with your time. Really appreciate uh, you going through all that.